Hello, I'm Senior Programmer Jen Wilson, and welcome to this film, Independent Presents Q&A for the National Geographic documentary, The Territory by Alex Pritz. Special thanks to our lead sponsor, The HIFPA, and our virtual screenings partner, Vision Media. And now please welcome our guest today, Director Alex Pritz. Thank you so much for joining us, Alex. Thanks, Jen. Um, the first question is one that I often start with right off at the top, which is, you know, we have a lot of members of Film Independent that are aspiring filmmakers. So I wondered if, if you could speak a little bit about how you became a filmmaker. Oh, that's a great way to start. Um, I came into film kind of from the side. I studied science, um, studied earth science and climate science and was really interested in the way that we relate to our planet, the way that we think about our planet, um, and just found that film was the most interesting way to explore some of those ideas that I had thought would take me in a, you know, more research-driven direction, but actually found that, um, you know, film and the arts were a better way for me to explore some of these ideas. Um, and yeah, it, it just, you know, kind of one thing in front of the other. I, I started out as a cinematographer working on a lot of other people's films, um, shot on John Casby's fantastic film, When Lambs Become Lions, and then had the opportunity to work on the first wave um, last year. And so I'd kind of learned my way around sets and, um, you know, working in these different environments and felt with the territory like I was ready to embark on a feature that I would direct. And so this is the first film I've made myself. So how did you uh, end up making a film about this um, Brazilian indigenous community, the Uru, Uru Wow Wow? Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, um, Uru e o Wow Wow. Uh, Uru, Uru e o Wow Wow, okay. It's a, it's a different kind of sound. We don't have as much in English, but um, I, I found this story through Nadinha, the activist at the center of the film. And I had read about her work, uh, seen some interviews that she'd done online and just thought, you know, holy, I don't know if I can swear in this, but, you know, holy cow, this is like the most incredible woman I've ever seen. Um, she's, she's out here defending the rainforest, defending indigenous rights and doing it in a part of the world where uh, in the 2018 elections in Brazil, 80% of people voted um, for the far right candidate, Jair Bolsonaro. So I just reached out to her and said, look, I, I love what you're doing. I think you're an incredible force. And if Bolsonaro, this was during the campaign that I reached out, I said, you know, if, if he wins, it looks like your life and your work is going to become so much more difficult. I'd like to be there um, with you through that. And, and could I come meet you? And so it started from these really humble beginnings, um, you know, just a one way ticket to, to meet her in Brazil and quickly saw that, that, that this was a, a real story with, with very real stakes. Um, and it grew to then incorporate the indigenous perspective of the Uruwa people who Nadinha had this 40 year relationship with. Um, and, you know, obviously that has become the, the central focus of the film in many ways, but it started through, through Nadinha herself. So the, the Amazon rainforest is um, the importance of this film, you know, is that we all, we all know very well now that the Amazon rainforest has been called the lungs of the world and, you know, the impact of its damage, what it has for the rest of us and for climate change. And so were you thinking about that when you were filming the scenes of like the, the trees being chainsawed and in things being burnt because I felt physically in pain watching that. It yeah. feels so serious now. In the past, I've, I've seen so many environmental documentaries and it feels so much different now. Um, were you thinking about that in the way that you were filming what was going on? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we were all aware at this point that that the Amazon rainforest is one of the biggest and strongest buffers we have against runaway climate change. And, and if we want to have a habitable planet, you know, there's, there's no planet B, this is, this is what we've got. And if we want to make it work, if we want to continue to survive on this little rock in space, we've got to keep that forest standing. It's, it's really simple. Uh, and so filming with these farmers and, and settlers that are invading this protected indigenous land and burning it away, in the hopes that they can get, you know, just a, a small piece of land for them and their family. 
uh, it, it felt so short-sighted and myopic and, and painful to, to be there witnessing that. Um, but at the same time, it felt really important to be able to get those images because at, as we were filming that, Bolsonaro was in the media saying it's NGOs and indigenous people lighting fire to the rainforest to drum up support for their you know, campaign to undermine Brazil's national sovereignty, you know, classic far right thing. Um, and so getting those images and showing what's really happening felt, felt really important. And a lot of the motivation to do that came from early conversations with Bitete and Nadinha, who said, if you wanna do something different, if you wanna make a film that really resonates, go talk to the people that are burning and lighting fire to the rainforest. Like they're the cause of this conflict, not us. You can't just talk to us and understand why this is happening. We're the recipients of this conflict. And they're out there doing this with impunity, without much fear of repercussion. And, and they'll talk to you, you know, it might be hard at first, but eventually you can, you can get in there and they'll be open with you because they really do see themselves as heroes. They think of themselves as the virtuous pioneers going out and creating something out of nothing. Uh, and I, as an American, felt that there was a really strong parallel there to my own country's history and the founding national mythology of America, this idea of manifest destiny, the idea of divine right to the land, the idea that land is empty, you know, devoid of life until some Westerner, you know, white person comes along and discovers it, charts it along their, you know, X, Y coordinates. Obviously, all of that is false, but I saw it playing out in real time in Brazil and thought, you know, this is actually really important to, to critically investigate. So when you when you inter interviewed the farmers and, and the settlers, what, what was their attitude towards you? Uh, so we'll just start with that. What was their attitude towards you? They were really skeptical at first. Um, you know, we had this conversation with Bita and Nadinha and, and they said, why don't you go and, and try to film with these guys, try to make contact? And I was like, genuinely a little scared at first. You know, these are unpredictable people. I didn't know anything about them. Um, they're very closed off, very skeptical. And when I first met with them, they were very skeptical of me. They thought that, um, you know, I was there to do a hit job on them. And they really see themselves though, as, as heroes, like I said, that they are the people on whose back the country has been built and that they should be celebrated for, for doing that. At one point, Martins, one of the settlers says, you know, this is how Brazil was built in every other country too. And in a sense, he's correct. That is how Brazil was built through chainsaws and through the expropriation of indigenous land and violence towards those people. And it is how America was built in a lot of other, you know, settler, settler colonial countries. That doesn't make it right, but it is true. And so I, I basically said, look, I'm here. I will give you guys an honest platform to try to speak your truth. And I will try to understand where you're coming from and what your motivations are. And I'm not going to paint you as a storybook villain, you know, as, as a one dimensional creature, a mindless, you know, uh, creature of evil. And, and that ended up working out, you know, I think as well, spending equal time filming them in the hot sun, digging holes, as filming them, you know, stealing land, showed them that that I was going to try to to capture the complexity of the situation that they find themselves in, and I really do genuinely feel compassion for a lot of these people who are poor and marginalized farmers. You know, the thing that they're not seeing that I see is that they're a victim of the same forces that are plundering indigenous land. It's to the benefit of the political and business elite class in Brazil, as in many other countries, to keep poor marginalized people fighting amongst themselves, when really the enemy to Sergio and Martins and these, these settlers are not indigenous people that are holding them back. It's these mega farmers and ranchers creating monoculture beef and soy plantations that they can't compete with and pushing them into the economic periphery where they feel their best option is to go out and colonize new land as the tip of the spear um, you know, eventually feeding these same systems that put them in that place in, in the first place. Right. And, and it's easier to try to push, push the indigenous people around because they're not wealthy and don't have the defense. So one right. of the, one of the things that um, the tribe, do you call them a tribe or you call them a community? Uh, in Brazil and in, indigenous people is preferred. Indig indigenous people. Yeah. Um, one of the things the, the indigenous people um, learned 
seem to learn to do for the, for themselves is to use technology. Like they use a drone to see how close the settlers are getting and which parts of their land they're on. And, and then they start using the cameras. Um, did they have this technology when you met them or did, who was it that introduced them to using things like this? Yeah, so Bitate, this young 18 year old, um, really a kid when we first met him, he was a digital child, you know, he had a cell phone, he was on Instagram, he, he was well connected to the world. And that was part of the reason that at such a, you know, tender young age of, of 18, he was given this huge responsibility of, of becoming the leader of his people and defending this huge area of land that's crucial for the entire world's survival, but also, you know, the future of, of his embattled indigenous community. And so, Part of the reason for that was his ability to harness the media and harness, you know, these new forms of technology. So in the film, you see drones, you see walkie talkies, GPS, all of this is equipment that Bitate got himself through grant applications, working with Nadinia to try to get these tools that could help expand, you know, their surveillance capabilities. When COVID came, we as a film team looked at the way that Bitate had been using media already and said, wow, you know, here we are making a, an artistic film. These guys are using film for evidentiary purposes. Maybe we can combine this, you know, Bitate, Nadinia, how do you guys feel? And the response we got from the Uruva Wow was, yes, we, we can film the final chapter of this story. Bring us better audio equipment, bring us, you know, real cinema cameras, and we've got it from here. And so from COVID on, we begin working with the community as co-producers of the film. Uh, you know, to document their experience from the inside out. But yeah, it's one of the most interesting parts of the film, I think, is, is seeing this community go from being kind of pushed around in, in some ways, you know, mounting a fierce and, and brave resistance, but then finding their voice politically through the media and through this idea of, of narrative sovereignty, of asserting themselves um, in a more public way, led by Bitate, this inspiring young individual, was, was so cool. And one of the things... I know I'm, maybe this is a long answer, but- um, Oh no, I love it. Keep going. One of the things Bolsonaro and people on the right do in Brazil is try to denigrate people as, you know, they'll, they'll use it as a slur, iPhone Indians. Meaning that if you have a cell phone, if you engage with technology, you can no longer claim access to that identity. Meaning conversely that the only real indigenous people in their twisted minds are- you know, deep in the forest, not engaged in political life, not causing any trouble for them. And I just felt so inspired by Bitate and these young people, this new generation that reject that false binary outright and say, no, I am technologically sophisticated, media savvy. I'm here, I'm causing trouble for you. And I'm in touch with my culture and my heritage and my roots. And that those those are not separate things. Actually, they're, they're the same thing. Um, and, you know, one final thing is, after we've we finished the film, Bitate uh, has just become the first member of the Uruwao to go to university. He's studying journalism now at the Federal University of Hondonia. This fall was his first semester. So really excited for him as well. So yeah, I was I was going to ask because uh, um, so many things have happened now because Br uh, Brazil just elected a new president. Was this in the last week, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, I was going to ask you like what, what is going on with the indigenous people now? How are they doing? And do you think the regime change in Brazil is, is going to be positive for them? Yeah, the, the election that happened a week ago, um, Lula uh, da Silva won against Bolsonaro. And for the Uruwau and, and all of the indigenous communities I've spoken to in Brazil, this is um, you know really welcome change. Uh, I think it's at the same time, naive to think that their problems will go away with a new president. These are problems that have been around for hundreds of years. Generations of people have been fighting against these issues. And, you know, the, the, the fight will certainly not cease to exist, but at least there's somebody in power who will listen now and, and who's open to thinking about this uh, in, a, in a way that expands beyond simple, you know, uh, short-sighted resource plunder. Do you know if they're still having people um, trying to uh, come on the land and um, start yeah. farms on the land? Are they still having to deal with that? 
the the Uruguay is one of the most threatened and invaded territories in in all of Brazil, and so there are tons of illegal miners, loggers, invaders, um, you know, flooding their land. Uh, and you know, in some ways, we're a little worried that this fall, before Lula gets in, maybe there's even a bigger push because this might be their last moment of of some impunity. Um, but at the same time, the the Uruguay and a lot of other indigenous communities are are using media in these really exciting ways. Uh, the Uruguay have are starting a media and cultural center where they're going to have a production studio in their land um, where they'll be continuing to make films and advocate for themselves. The same is happening with tons of other indigenous communities across Brazil. And it's part of this really exciting movement of young people um, using the media. And I think that also played a role in, in this election as well. Um, you know, certainly the indigenous movement was, was strong and loud and, and played a part in this last election. Um, it's really um, completely amazing to me um, because I was, you know, I, in in the beginning, you know, you see all the the trees being chopped down and, and things being burned, and you're and and then you know, uh, Nadine is trying to call for help from the you know the government in not getting any, basically not getting any response or a response that's like I can't do anything for you with an attitude of like we don't really care, and you're just like, what are they going to do? But then when you start to see like the you, how the use of the technology because she you know she tells them they're saying they can't do anything unless they have proof and then they're like okay here we go <laughs> we're gonna do it I'm gonna give you yeah. some proof and i was just i was amazed at how they embraced that i thought it was also so interesting that that shot of um um uh, Bita bitate is that what his name is yeah he was going to give a speech and he was like, I think I'll start with me and then do the <laughs> elders. And Medina was like, no, <laughs> you need to do the elders first. Trust me. And it was just so interesting, you know, like how young he is and, and like his perspective on things versus hers. Cause you know, she's been there for a longer time amount of time. Um, so that, that was really interesting. She she carries a lot of wisdom and she would do the same thing to us all the time too. Like, hey, Alex, no, that's not how you're going to do this. <laughs> that doesn't fly here. Um, and, and she was teaching me the whole time. We were so lucky to have her both as, you know, this strong, powerful uh, protagonist in the film, but also just as a, a mother figure and mentor to, to our entire team that was learning um about a culture that wasn't ours about a, a part of the world that um you know we were we were absorbing a lot of new information around and, and she she has that that teacherly vibe professor at heart in so in one of the more shocking parts of the movie um one of one of the indigenous people is actually killed is actually found murdered um and the police do come i'm just wondering if anything ever came from that police investigation if they had figured out if it was one of the settlers who did it did anything happen with that the police have arrested a suspect um and it's it's a long convoluted process you know i think justice is elusive in this part of brazil and it's required a ton of effort from nadinha from the Uruguay to to get to this point the suspect who's been arrested was already in jail for life and so, um, you know, no major disruption to anybody's life by having them be the, the suspect. Uh, at first, it was treated as a, a hate crime, you know, related to the environmental defense work that Ari was engaged in. Now it's being sent back down as, uh, you know, the police are claiming it's a simple barroom fight or something of the sort. And so that's all being appealed by the Uruguay now, and um, we will we will see how that process goes. But it, the the fight for justice is certainly continuing. Yeah, that part was really amazing, and and it's also amazing to see how they all just like regroup and get themselves back together and keep going after you know like that's the ultimate weapon of intimidation is we're we're just going to start killing you then if you're not going to let us do what we want to do 
Yeah. And it's amazing to me that they recover from that and and just keep going on. Although I suppose this is a, a you know hundreds of years of enduring something like this, and so in a, a way they're sadly used to it. Yeah, it it was incredibly messed up, unfair. It, it was a, a really hard thing, and you know I think they be to Tay um took on more responsibility after that for sure but i don't think the community has recovered i mean he was a, a teacher in a local school he has two kids that he's left behind he's got a wife and a mother and um was really very active in in the territorial defense and so the the hole that's been left by his passing is uh his murder is is still a, a big part of the community i think was that really shocking for you and your crew when that happened? And then that did that sort of make you you all feel like did it make you feel good that you were making the film? Because what happened justifies, you know, you're capturing this, or or did you have a sort of a feeling like I want to give up? This is too much, it's too intense. No, I think we definitely all, we, we stopped filming for a while. We questioned whether it was worth it to keep going, you know, what the, the, the physical risks to everybody involved were, what the, you know, emotional weight of trying to continue this story without him would be. Um, it was a, a, a long, hard reflection, I think, through that period of time, um, especially you know, the, the Uruwau culture doesn't speak about the dead, um, you know, doesn't carry images of the dead. People are buried with all their belongings. And so, you know, it, it was a really hard thing to, to talk about. I also, it was at the very beginning of COVID that it happened. So we weren't able to, I wasn't able to physically be there and, and grieve with the community. It was a, a really hard time period, I think. So uh, I'm just wondering, um... I was going to ask what what do you hope that people's major takeaway from the film is um i hope that people uh you know follow these young indigenous storytellers as they they keep making films and, and putting work out into the world i think you know for me one of the clearest things is that indigenous people are the best guardians of the forest you know they are the best defense we have against deforestation. Indigenous people are less than 5% of the global population and defend over 80% of global biodiversity. Uh, so if, if we want to keep living here, um, we've, we've got to have them be at the center of every conversation about climate change that's happening. There, there can't be conversations that exclude them from here on out. Um, yeah, I think that, that would probably be the main one for me. So what's next for you? Do you have another film planned or already been working on another film? Uh, the consummate question. Um, <laughs> I, yes, I've got a lot of ideas I'm really excited about. Um, I am gonna see through the territory you know, this fall and we've got a really strong impact campaign planned around the rest of the film. Um, you know, Some legislative goals, uh, working to support more indigenous filmmakers. And so that will be, you know, a, a continued focus over the next couple of years, but I'm definitely excited to get back to uh, shooting and, and making another film soon. And when does the territory come out? We don't have an official release date yet, but it will be before the end of the year on Disney Plus. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming today and uh, talking with me. Um, I really appreciate it. This film was amazing. It's amazing and eye opening and just an incredible watch. I think that a lot of people should see it. Thank you so much, Jen. All right. Bye.